The topic for tonight's uh, shear is the bounds, or are there bounds, to giving Muslim? You know, how far can you go? And I use this title to really capture what I think is a question that deals with the whole episode that began four parshiyas ago of Yosef and his brothers. Offhand, on a, on a superficial level, Yosef is treating his brothers in a very harsh way. In fact, one might even say that he treats his father harshly in the fact that he never notifies his father that he's okay, that he's alive. And you may say that as long as he was in jail or he was a slave, maybe it was impossible for him to do so. But we find that even when he became the viceroy of Egypt, the greatest civilization of his time, he still didn't send any message back to his father. And all of the Farshim deal with this question, you know, how to understand Yosef. And of course the question has to be seen in a broader perspective because Yosef is not just called Yosef HaTzadik because he's able to overcome in a very self-disciplined way all his temptations and, you know, he was in the situation of Eishas Fotifera, Vayonas Achutza. Yosef is a Tzadik because of his moral level. And we're going to see this over and over again throughout the parashio that the Torah speaks about his, his level of kibbut Avaim as being on the highest and his respect for his brothers. In fact, we'll find in the Mepharshim a very strong movement in the direction of assuming that Yaakov never ever found out about the sale of Yosef. Yosef withheld that information from his father until death do us part. Now imagine if Yosef, as the Torah testifies, overlapped with Yaakov for the last 17 years of his life, by Yechi Yaakov Shvas Reishon at the beginning of this week's parsha, And nevertheless, despite any interaction between Yosef and his father, Yosef never told his father what happened. And why? So the Mepharshim say it's almost a universal consensus. He wanted to protect his brothers. He was afraid that Yaakov, just like he, he, would, he would curse Ruvain for his Pachas Kamayim, and he would curse Shimon Valevi for Arur Apam Kiyaz, that maybe he would do the same in the case of the brothers. For sure, Yaakov would be very, very spiteful against his brothers. Yosef respected them. And yet, oddly enough, look at the entire series, the sequence of events, the chain, the, the agonizing torture almost that the brothers are subjected to over the course of all these parishes. I want to suggest that there are three different approaches to unravel the mystery, or shall I say reconcile Yosef's great moral sensitivity on the one hand with what seems at a superficial level to be almost his cruelty vis-a-vis -vis his brothers on the other hand. And the first approach is the approach of Rav Shimshon Lafal Hirsch. When I say first, I don't mean on a chronological, historical basis, but it's an approach that I think has a lot of, a, a lot of validity to it, and it's very deep and very profound. I'm not going to dedicate tonight's Shia to Rav Shimshon Lafal Hirsch, because my sentiments lie with the Ramban's approach, as you'll soon see in the, in the source sheets that I prepared for you. But Rav Shem Shofar Hirsch speaks about the unity of Klal Yisrael. I mean, the, you know, the Avos were involved in this entire process of creating a, a chain, a transmission of Knesset Yisrael, you know, the nation of God. And one by one, they were excluding, they were sort of bouncing off those who were to be rejected from the scene. So we have the rejection of Yishmael in the case of, uh, of Yitzhak and his brother. We have the rejection of Esau in the case of Yaakov and his brother. And finally, when we get to the Shivte Ka, we have a universal acceptance of every single one of the Bnei Yaakov as being the, the fathers, so to speak, and the transmitters of Torah and of Jewish nationhood throughout the generation. If this be so, then we would hope for unity. Says Rav Hirsch, following the episode in the aftermath of the sale of Yosef, there didn't seem to be very, very much room for optimism that there would be unity in Kali's. And truth be told, had Yosef just shown up one day and said, "Okay, you know, let's be let's be good brothers," and you know, it would have been almost humanly impossible to overcome all the resentment and the anger. I mean that. that that stuff, you know, is pent up within a person. Isn't it natural? And Yosef was looking for a way through a long protracted process 
of reuniting the brothers and making Klal Yisrael, Knesset Yisrael, into one entity. And Rav Shinsel first goes into detail about how Yosef planned this out. The scheme was detailed. Every step of the way was meant to somehow um, to, to, to bind, correct, to bind, to reconnect uh, the, the pieces of the puzzle, the, the people of Israel together to form, to form one entity. That's one approach. The other approach, which is also quite common, and I think most people would have given this answer, is what I call the approach of the Bali Musar, of the mitzvah tolchacha, of castigation. From a perspective of Hilchus Tshuva, we're all familiar with the famous statement of the Rambam, in the second parak of Hilchus Tshuva, Ezi Tshuva Gemura. You know, there are different levels of repentance. The highest of which is when a person is placed back in the same situation that he sinned in earlier, previously in his life. And he's back in the same temptation. He's got the same powers and the same abilities and the prowess. He's still young and he could, he could be tempted once again. And yet on the second round, he overcomes temptation. He's self-disciplined. That is, according to the Ram of Tshuva Gemura. Within the context of Tokacha, of castigation, of disciplining someone, and you can think of this as a parent visiting your own children, is it possible that out of love, Yosef in this case, is putting his brothers into a situation which is almost identical, he's recreating, he's cloning all the details of that led in the first round to the Avera, to the terrible sin of Mechiras Yosef. And seeing to it that on this round, the brothers of Hashem and as they declare, have really done a sincere truth. The problem I find with this approach, although as I said at the outset, it's very common, and it's very uh, almost intuitive on the part of many, many people, is that does the mitzvah of Musar know no bounds? Is there no limit to how far you can go in order to give Muslim? Do I, as a human being, have the right to manipulate your life, even if you're on my, own, my own child, to recreate the situation of sin, to put you through the ringer, over the battle, and create such a tormentous and, 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 and difficult set of circumstances just to afford you with the opportunity to choose them? How far does it go? And yet we know that the Rabbi and Hilchus Deos tells us, with regard to giving Musr and Tochacha, we have to be extremely careful. The limit is, but al tal bin pnei chavercha. Never humiliate your friend. That's the bounds. To put someone through such torment, I don't know. And here we have to really analyze it. You know, has Yosef, from this particular perspective, and this approach crossed the bounds, crossed the red line, gone too far in his pursuit of the mitzvah of Tolchacha and Musa. If I may, is that not what we see Yosef's problem as being? Probably why they, he, they, he bothered the brothers so much to begin with. When he was a kid, when he used to say, he used to watch over them and see, and he used to give reports back to Yaakov. I mean, it was like a little bit of a... He was needling them. Right, he used to... Right. Yeah, but there it couldn't be Bittoris Musa. We no, have to find some explanation for needling them. <laughs> and again, Tommy, I want to emphasize, because you missed this point at the outset, that Yosef is very sensitive to the feelings of his brothers. Ad Kach, we mentioned that according to most of the Yosef never revealed to his father to the day that death parted them, separated them, what the brothers had done. The crime, the terrible crime they had perpetrated against him. Why? He wanted to protect his brothers. And how often did he say to them with great sensitivity, don't get concerned, this was part of a divine scheme, a divine plan, you're not guilty. And I'll go even a step further. According to the Baliatosis, David, this is my mind. If you've never heard this, it's Kedai to listen up. This is unbelievable. The Baliatosta said, despite the close relationship in the first 17 years of his life between Yosef and his father Jacob, he, Yosef, being the Talmud Muvak, the disciple par excellence of his father Jacob, who was his Rebbe, 
Ad Kedai Kach that in the, in the episode of Aishas Potiphar, what prevented him from sin was, you know, that super ego, that view, that vision of his Rebbe, of Yaakov Avinu. Ad Kedai Kach that when 22 years go by and Yaakov wants to send a message to his father, hey, I'm alive and well, what does he send his father? The Agolos? Meaning, the last sugya that we learned together some 22 years ago was the sugya of Eglar Rufa. It's like my Rebbe once in the middle of the Shia had to go out. And he came back and he said, well, we'll have to reconvene tomorrow. Tomorrow he comes back and he continues the Shia in the, same, in the middle of the same sentence that he left off. You know what I mean? That's Yosef. Such an impact. And now at the end of Yaakov's life, Yosef overlaps with his father how many years? Again, the key number here is 17. I don't want to get into Gamachios, even though yesterday was my daughter's 17th birthday. <laughs> but it's unbelievable that Yosef overlaps with his father as a youth for 17 years. And again, as the viceroy of Egypt in Yaakov's elderly years, another 17 years. I, it's hard to believe that that's coincidental. But we would have expected a very close interaction between Yosef and his father, seeking the advice of Father Jacob of his Rebbe Mufak as leader of the greatest civilized civilization of, of, of its time. And yet, we don't find any interaction between Yosef and his father Yaakov. In fact, they're sending messages here and there. Finally, Yosef, you know, Yaakov finds out that, uh, that it's time to, you know, Yosef finds out that his father Yaakov is not doing too well. You know, he comes to see him with that Friday menage. I mean, where's the close relationship that we, the interaction? says the Tosis Baliatosis, the Canaan Baliatosis. Yosef deliberately avoided his father. Why? Because he would be asked the question. Exactly. It could not be that at some point Yaakov wouldn't have raised the issue. What hey, happened? tell me yeah. the story. What happened? <laughs> How'd you end up down here? You know what I'm saying? Tonight's and perhaps Yosef, <laughs> he was Choshesh, you know, the, the, the mission in Ovis says, Asus Yogla Torah, a person has to find a Harchaka for himself. Yosef found a Harchaka because less the situation arise and the and the obvious the atmosphere be generated in which he might slip and reveal the truth about his brothers. So what did he do? He denied himself the greatest pleasure that he himself, Yosef, could have enjoyed to have again that relationship with Father. And the truth be told, I'm sorry that I'm going off on a tangent because my father's gone now about 20 years and I don't know what I would pay to spend even one evening with him and ask him all my questions, and he would set me straight. Although I admit that some questions he would say, I'm oh, sorry, I don't know if I can answer that question. <laughs> you know, we think that our fathers can answer all the questions and all the problems. He would ask his father. <laughs> Maybe he could ask his father, and then it would go back to his great-grandfather, who I never knew, but I always wanted to meet, because my father used to always talk about him. In any event, imagine the case of Yosef being marking himself, staying away deliberately, denying himself, all to protect his brother. Also, you remember when he reveals himself to his brothers. Who does he get rid of beforehand? He'll see you alive. You take him away. Why? The major says he didn't want to embarrass his brothers, even though he took a certain level of risk. After all, he wasn't absolutely convinced, 100% sure, that they wouldn't take again revenge against him. As they, if they didn't succeed on the first round, maybe let's, let's, let's finish the job. But once again, he was sensitive to their moral status, to their possibility of being exposed to a humiliating situation. If the Mitzvah would find out, you sold our leader, your own brother? What a bunch of low lives you are. So to spare them the possibility of humiliation, he exposed himself to personal danger. You know, there's an argument against this in both of them. The first one is that he wasn't protecting his brothers. He's protecting his father. Good. For his father the Rambat has both, actually. Yeah, I know. For his father to live with this pain would have been, it would have killed him, probably. You're talking about ten of his sons being guilty of this one. And in the second case, right, his stature increases dramatically because he is the brother and the son of Yaakov and the, and the brother of these people. He's no longer a mystery in Egypt. Right. Ah, he comes from a noble family. The noble family that sold him, you know, as a, as a Rodave, that, that's the noble family he comes from? It destroys stature. 
Right, so in, uh, from pragmatic so point David, of view, a, a few days I ago, I don't otherwise. want to give the same shear that I gave a few days ago again, but uh, you, you can listen to it online if it, in a week or so when it goes up. I gave a shear on the moral stature of Yosef. And I really, again, I, in my humble opinion, I think I really made a great case for the fact that Yosef is a tzaddik, not just on the level of his personal temptation, but also in moral sensitivity. And I think you could really see that Yosef is trying his hardest you know, to protect the brothers, to make them feel good about themselves. And therefore, it's hard for me to believe that his response to his brothers was out of cruelty in any sort of way, or perhaps getting back, you know, revenge or, or so. And, and in any event, let, let, me, let me continue, because really, no, I'm afraid I won't get to the subject of tonight's shir. Sometimes I have a tendency of giving too many introductions. Really, what the shir about tonight is a third approach. We're not talking about the unity of Klausel and patching up all the, all the disunities. We're not talking about Musser and Tshuva and Yosef artificially manipulating the situation to create the ambiance for Tshuva Gemur. No. But rather the Ramban's approach. And that's what I'd like to study with you tonight. And that's what these two pages are all about, so we be, better get moving, <laughs> okay? First, let's start with the dreams of Yosef. Vayachlom Yosef Chalom, this is in Periklam at Zion. It's And the Torah testifies, Vayagid le'achiv, le'chav, and he notifies his brothers, Vayosifu od snoso. Now keep in mind, the dream hasn't been specified yet. Right? Later on in the parsha, you know, if somebody wants to keep this page open for me later and, and open up to the Chumash to Periklam and Zion for me, I would appreciate it. But if you'll take a look later on in the Psukim, Yosef relates the details of, of his dreams. So what's he saying now? He's telling them, I had a dream. Now, what's, what's their response? Vayosifu od snow so. More hatred. He's generating more resentment. Not enough was there resentment because Yaakov Avinu had chosen Yosef and given him the Ketonis Pasim and, and, and loved him more than the other brothers. Whatever that means, again, that's another shift for a different occasion. But now, they're going to increase their hatred against him as a result of his dreams. And yet, Vayomer Aleyah. Yosef says to them, Shimu na, please emphasize the word na, hachalom hazesh archalamti. Please listen to the details. Until now I've told you in general that I, I had a dream. But now I want you to hear the details. And I'm begging you to hear the details. Na is usually a lotion of tchina, of petition. Wait a minute. Let's slow down for a second. Yosef is a bardas. Yosef is a paradigm of a wise person, if there ever was one. He's got seichel and oshi. He's got normal, normal intelligence. Does it make sense to beg your brothers to listen to the dream? when you know already, because the Torah has already told us that Yosef knew, that as a result of the dream, they'll hate him even more, they'll harbor even more intense resentment against him. Shimu no? It sounds like they weren't interested in hearing his dream. But he beseeched them. He forced it upon them. And why? Why would Yosef do such a thing? And I believe, and we're going to see it in the Ramban, although the Ramban never says the words that I'm about to say explicitly, but I think it underlies the entire thesis that will tie together how many Rambans do I have here and a couple of Rashis to boot, a whole bunch, that Yosef's dreams were not dreams that you and I dream. It's not like we go to sleep at night and we dream about what we dream during the day or anything like that. Yosef's dreams were nevuah, were prophecy. And if you take a look in the Pasuk in Baaloscha, do you still have that open here? Uh, no. Well, we closed it. All right, here we are. 
Listen to this possible. This is at the end of Parshas Baal Oscha. You remember the story of Miriam and Aaron who were a little bit upset with Moshe and they spoke Lush and Hora. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives a whole presentation to Miriam and, Mo- and, and Aaron and he says the following. Vayoma shivu no dvorai. Listen carefully, he says. Im ye Hashem. If there will be prophets of God, true prophets, b'mara elav es vado, I will appear to the prophet in a vision, b'chalom adaber bo. Interesting, the word chalom. Chalom in the sefer, and nevuah in the ratio of the same possible. I create a, an equation, a tautology. A equals A. Navu equals Chalom. Chalom equals Navu. Again, there are Chalomos that are one sixtieth of Navu, but then there are Chalomos that are Navu Mamish. And those are the Chalomos of all the Navim throughout the generations, with the exception of one. And that's Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't dream dreams. His Navu was Pel Bek Adabra, but like I speak to you, God speaks to Moshe. Oh, you have to listen to a Chalom which is Nevoa. Yosef's whole life is one continuous chain of Chalomos, all of which, without exception, have the status of Nevoa. If this be the case, then I begin to understand, perhaps, why Yosef beseeches his brothers, Shimu no, please listen to the Chaloma Sher when a Nevoa, when a Navi experiences, receives a Nevoa, he has to share it. He cannot keep it bottled up. In this case, he's got to share it with those to whom that Nevoa is relevant, namely, his brothers. That interpretation Yosef understood, as he always understood his dreams. Shivu no, please. I know it doesn't make any logical sense for me to tell you these dreams. You're going to hate me even more. But I'm a Navi. And I received this nevua from Hashem. I have to share it with you. Please listen to it. If this be the case, then I begin to understand another parsha in Tanakh, one in which we're all familiar. This is Yoshua when he's conquering Eretz Yisrael. In this case, Givon. Shemesh be Givon do. Now, wait a minute. Yeshua's a good guy, and he's very authoritative. He's the leader of Klal Yisrael. He inherits the position of Moshe Rabbeinu, but does, does that give him the power to control the sun? And the Medrash in two places, the Medrash Rabbah and Medrash Agoda, delves into this question. In fact, according to the Medrash, there was a dusiach, there was a debate between the Shemesh and Yosef Hatzat, and, and excuse me, and, and, and Yoshua. Take a look, it's the second source on your page. At Hamotzi, you'll find Bishosh Eba Yoshua le Givon, Ubikesh le Shashek es He wanted to freeze the sun, so to speak. That's a funny kind of word to use about the sun. And the Shemesh said, I underlined on the second line, Omer la Shemesh, Vilona Edom, why should I freeze in my place? Are you greater than me? Do you have the power to command me? I get my rules from a higher, from a higher authority. The Od, and furthermore, Yesh Kata Mitzav Al Gadol Mimenu? You're inferior to me. Do you, Yoshua, as a human being, mortal, here today and gone tomorrow, you have the right to command me? And I have to obey your command? I need Gadol Mimcha, I'm greater than you. I need a race of Yom Revi, I need a race of Yom Shishi, etc., etc. I need Kavua Bashamayim, you're down on earth. Omelo Yoshua, wait a minute. I have one thing over you. You have to listen to me. You are subservient to me, says Yoshua. Why? So he gives a couple of arguments. Lo zu bilvad el li Yosef. You already accepted Yosef. As your sovereign ruler, you bow down to him. Shenema vehine Hashemesh vayareach, etc. In Bracious Rabba, which I don't have here for you on the page, is a slightly different version, but basically the same. And the Medjus Rabba adds one line. 
Yoshua Mizera Yosef. Why does Yoshua have the right to contend against the son? Because he is a descendant of Yosef. As such, he inherits the Malucha of Yosef over the son. And therefore, I command you, says Yoshua, Shemesh Begivon Dom. You're subservient to me, you bow down to my forefather Yosef, and therefore you have to accept my command. The bottom line is, we see something fascinating from this Chazal. And that is, that the dreams of Yosef, maybe even beyond the Vua, beyond prophecy, have the power to create a reality. In this case, the reality of the Avdus Kaviochel of the Shemesh to Yosef and therefore to his descendants, to Yoshua. And please take a look, if you have any doubts about the fact that at least according to Rashi and the Ramban and many others, the Chalomos are true. They are prophetic. Take a look at Rashi in Perek Lamed Zayin Pasuk Yutes. Vayomu isha elechov hine bala Chalomos halazebo. They see Yosef coming up in the distance, getting closer. And let's take a look at, uh, at this Balach Alomos. And then they say, It says, Let's see what's going to be with his dreams. Rashi says, Why did the Torah feel compelled to add this? You know, that they said, Ma, you, Chalom Osof. Ruach HaKodesh Omer Eskim. Hain Omrim Nahar Genu. They're saying we're going to kill him. Vakasu, but the Pesach itself, the Torah itself testifies, Vinira Ma, you, Chalom Osof. Hey, buddies, we'll see what's going to be with this Chalom Osof. Nira Dvar Mi Yokum. Shalachem Oshali. What does it mean, Shali? God is saying, this is my word. This is my prophecy. It will be fulfilled, like it or not. Try as, as hard as you will to undermine these prophecies. You will not succeed. And here I want to add something. If you skip two paragraphs down, it's a little bit out of order, and I apologize for that. In this week's Pasha that we're going to read in just a few days, there's a very difficult, complex pasuk, which is the bracha forms part of the bracha of Yaakov for Yosef. And the Pesach opens up with the words, Vateshev bi Esan Kashto. He, he sits with the powerful Keshet, you know, the bow. And there are many interpretations what this Keshet represents. But Rashi quotes Targumuglus. And what does Targumuglus say? Vateshev, which in Aramaic is Vateves. Behon, with your power, what's your Eitan, your power? Niviose. Your prophecy. You, Yosef, are powerful because of your prophecy. What prophecy? Says Unkelus, and Rashi quotes him, Hachalomos asher cholam lohem. I rest my case. Now I've got not just Rashi on my side, I've got Targum Unkelus, and as we'll soon see the Ramban, that's not bad company, by the way. And they all assume, pe'echot, unanimously, that the chalom of Yosef was nevuah, came from HaKadosh Baruch. And therefore, if the Torah itself testifies here in this Pesach, in Parshish Vayechi, that the chalomos, with Dvar Hashem, were nevuah, then I think we have to say the following. That a person who's capable of taking action which will guarantee the fulfillment of a prophecy, which will bring to fruition a prophecy, is duty-bound to do so. As the Mishnah says in Sanhedrin, HaKobesh Esan Esnevuoso, this is the fourth source on your page, or Navi She'ovar Al Divrei Atzmo, Misoso Bidei Shomayim. We're talking about a very severe violation if a Navi receives a prophecy, and he undermines the prophecy or does nothing to bring about the prophecy. Well, worse than that, he squelches the prophecy, he quells it. Rather than share it with others and transmit it, he keeps it to himself. In any of those cases, he's high of a very severe violation. So much power and weight is given to a prophecy. And again, getting back to Rashi, in the case of the Chalomos, again, in the original parsha of the Chalomos, Perek, 
Lamed Zayin. Vayisapir el Oviv vel Echov vayigar bo Oviv. Now he tells this is the second dream. You remember the dream about the 11 stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to him. And he tells it first to his father, then he tells it a second time to his father in the presence of his brothers. Vayigar bo Oviv it sounds like his father is castigating him and therefore shunning this whole idea of the Chalomos and yet look at the end of the post is this what's going to happen in the future I and your mother and your brothers will come and bow down to you and the next post says v'yaviv Shomar es Hadovar. Says Rashi, what's Shomar es Hadovar? Hoyemamtin umetzape mosayov. Now, the response of Yaakov Avinu to the dreams of Yosef is a very complicated, complex matter. Because Rashi and the Mephoshim say, on the one hand, Yaakov was baffled, he was perplexed. The Ereach apparently represents Rachel, Rachel was already gone. And therefore, Chazal derived in the Gemara and Brachos the conclusion that Ein Chalom believed Dvar Betelin. So it sounds like Yaakov Avinu, as reflected by the Torah Shabbat Peh, the Gemara and Brachos, un- understood that this was just the Chalom. But on the other hand, as the Ramban is going to amplify, Yaakov saw a very important role to play over here. He was trying to reduce the tension and the resentment between the brothers and Yosef. So basically, he tried to poo-poo these dreams. Try to say to the brothers, you know what? This, this man is, is dreaming about grandeur, about glory. These are dreams. They can't possibly be Nebuah. In fact, I'll prove it to you. Who's the Ereach? The Ereach represents, no doubt, Rachel. Well, she can't possibly come down to bow in front of Yosef because she's gone already. So it's Dvarim B'Telem. But was this really Yaakov's view? Or was he just playing that role superficially? You know, Ma'amid Panav, he was showing his face in that way in order to somehow mitigate the resentment between Yosef and his brothers. So if you take a look at the Ramban. Especially since dreams played a big role in his life. That's right, for sure. Take a look at the Ramban. The Ramban on this puzzle with the Shemesh and the Oreach, he goes through the whole story he wants to know first of all why didn't Yosef relate the first dream to his father Jacob and the answer is because Yaakov is not represented at all in the first dream just the brothers the it's only the second dream which is relevant to Yaakov and first, Vitam el Ochiv, Pam Sheniski Yisapro Soliov Bifnei Ochiv. He relates the, the dream first to his father, out of respect for his father, but then a second time in the presence of his father to his brothers. Allowing Yaakov to play a very important role here. Namely, to either certify the truth of and the veracity of this Nevoah, of this Chalom as a Nevoah, or to poo poo it and deny it. Ulafi Dati, take a look, I'm skipping because we don't have that much time. In the second paragraph, the Ramban says, Ki bi eshi yarad Yaakov lo mitzrayim, kvar mesa bila v'gam zilpa. The Ramban goes through a very long calculation to prove that it's impossible to assume that the Oreach represents Bilha, the way Rashi would like to have it. Because again, Rashi and the Ramban are both trying to make sense out of the Oreach element in this Chalom, because if it's an Avua, it's got to come to fruition. Rashi took the position that it's Bilha who raised Yosef as a mother, following the death of, of Yosef's biological mother, Rachel. The Ramban rejects that outright because Bilha and Zilpa, both Shvachos, were already gone. They were not included in the 70 Nefoshos that came down to Mitzrayim in the second year of the famine. But rather, in Yenachalom, and here I bolded it for you, skipping down a few lines, Ki Hashemesh remez li Yaakov, Vayereach remez li Bnei Beiso, Vichol Noshiv, Noshav, Shebahen Hayu Toldosov. 
the Yermos and the Rem is here of this dream, Ki Kol Toldos of Yishtachvulo. When the 70 Nefoshos came down to Mitzrayim, the entire base Yaakov with all the children and, and the grandchildren, they all bowed down in front of Yaakov. And this is the Rebbe's of the dream. Why then, asks the Ramban, did the, did the dream have to include the 11 stars, the Ochiv? And the Ramban has an explanation for that. Asher ishtachlulo b'fnei atzvon terem bo avihem. Because they, in fact, bowed down to Yaakov before I'm sorry, to Yosef, before Yaakov came down to Mitzrayim. So it's a process. Number one, the 11 kochavim, meaning all the shvatim, with the exception of Yosef himself, came down and first bowed down to Yosef. Then in the second round, Yaakov would be there, together with all of the toldos, and they would all, 70 of them, bow down to, ya- to Yosef. If this be the case, says the Ramban, and now we're skipping fast forward to, from Berek, Lamed Zion all the way to Perak Men Beis, and we have to put these two Rambans together. When the brothers come down to Mitzrayim, and they appear in front of Yosef for the first time, Vayizkar Yosef es ha-chalomos asher cholam lahem, says Rashi, what's asher cholam lahem? Alehem? Not lahem on them, but about them. Vayoda, says Rashi, sheniskaimu. Rashi insists that the dreams were fulfilled, they were brought to fruition, and that's what Yosef immediately became aware of. And as usual, the Ramban argues with Rashi. Ulufi daiti hadover behepach. What does behepach mean? Opposite. Pumfaket, just the opposite. By Yizkar Yosef's chalom also, it's according to the Ramban means he realized that the dream was not fulfilled. Why could this not possibly be the fulfillment of the dream? of the Nevoah, who wasn't there? Again, there were 11 stars that were meant to bow down. Who was missing? Binyamin was missing. Ki yomer ha-kosel ki beros Yosef es echov mishtachlun al-zokher kol chamosa shalcholen v'yoda shalon neskayim echad mehem b'pam azos. Not even one of his dreams were fulfilled. And certainly not both of his dreams. Ki yodea b'pitrona. He knew, he was convinced in the Interpretation of the dream. Ki kol, please emphasize the word kol achiv yishtach v'lo b'tchila min ha-chalom ha-rishon, according to the first chalom. So this is before Yaakov comes down to Mitzrayim. All the 11 brothers are going to come down to Mitzrayim and bow down. V'hinei anachnu ma'almim alumim anachnu yirmoz l'chol echov achadasar. U'v'pam ha-shenis said in the second occasion, which is represented by the second of the second dream, Yishtachvulo Hashemesh Vayareach Vachadasar Kochavim and Achalom Hasheni Vikeman Shalom Ra Binyomini Mohem Since Yosef became aware of the fact that Binyomin was not there with them, Chashav Zos HaTachbul, he had to come up with a scheme in order to guarantee and bring to fruition his Nevuah, meaning the first Nevuah, the first Chalom, that Binyomin with the other brothers would come. That's why I got him to come back the second time? Correct. And why didn't he just reveal himself and say, I am Joseph, I'm your brother, and they'll bring down Binyomin, they'll bring down Yaakov. Says the Ramban, The Ramban learns this Mamsh like a Gemara, like a Sunya. Every word in the Chalom has to be understood, and every sequence of the two Chalomas has to be fulfilled. To the T. Lamar, why didn't he say to Maru Valuas, Ovi, bring my father up to Mitzrayim, and then send the Agolos, as he did in the second time, after they appeared in the second time? Ki oya Ovi, Bami, Yad, Sofik, he had no doubt that his father would come immediately. The Achreshin is Kayim Achaloma Rishon. In other words, now he, 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 he didn't want to bring Yosef, he, excuse me, he didn't want to bring Yaakov down to Mitzrayim at this point because then there would be no fulfillment of the first dream, namely the 11 brothers bowing down to Yosef without Yaakov. If he would have revealed himself at this point, Yaakov would have joined them. All the Nefashas would have joined them. It would have been 70, it would have been fulfillment of the second dream, but not the first dream. The Achreshin is Kaim Achalom Arishon. After the first dream was fulfilled, when they finally brought down Binyamin, he gave lahem 
he told them Lakayim Achalom Asheni. He revealed himself to his brothers immediately, without delay, in order to bring to fruition the second prophecy, the second dream. And now Yaakov would come with all seventy nefashos down to Mitzrayim. Says the Ramban, Valule came. If you don't accept my thesis, if you're not careful and meticulous about reading the Psukim, if you don't understand that Yaakov, that excuse me, that Yosef was trying to get Binyamin down, and therefore he said, Look, you're, you're not telling me the truth there. You're saying there's another brother that, that, that's back with his father. Where is your other brother? Let's see if you're, if you're good for your work. And all this to bring down Binyamin together with the brothers. Again, before Yaakov would come. Lule Cain, if not this, Hoya Yosef Chote Chet Godel. You would have to accuse Yosef of a tremendous, serious violation, which would be so atypical, as I said before in a shir that I gave earlier this week, of all the incidents in Yosef's life and all the pieces of the puzzle, and it's a very complicated and broad puzzle, to see the sensitivity of Yosef with his brothers and in, in general his moral sensitivity even towards, towards the Mitzrayim. Again, I, now I don't want to get into it now, but even towards, even towards Aisha's Fotifar, he had, he had, he had such, such sensitivity. Yosef Avel. Avel means morning. Shikul is, is the loss of a child. It's the greatest, most intense bereavement that man could know. And not only that, Al Shimon, he is also, if you remember, incarcerated Shimon, so that even, even gets it even worse. The Af Imin, even if you'll come and claim, which is absolutely antithetical to everything we know about Yosef and his personality, maybe he wanted to take some revenge against his brother. It wouldn't be commensurate to the suffering of 22 years that he went under on Echlo Yachmal al Sevas Aviv. Nevertheless, he certainly would have compassion on his father. There was no reason to, to torment his father. Avol, and here I bolded this. This line in the Ramban, in my opinion, captures the secret of all these parashas that we've been learning. Four parashas that are dedicated to Yosef. Avolos hakol osom. Yofe bi'ito. That's a phrase from Tanakh. Yofe bi'ito means this was well positioned in its time. This was a proper response to the to the moment, the need of the moment. Lekayim hachalomos. How would you translate those words? Lekayim hachalomos. To fulfill, to bring to fruition those dreams. Ki yada, because he knew she is kayim of MS. Why the MS? The word MS, by the way, is only used in two cases. One for the Torah, which is called Torah's MS, or Akash Baruch, who is called, obviously called MS, or for a Nevuah, which is called the Vuas MS. That's why I believe that the Ramban, although he never uses, to my, the best of my knowledge, the phrase, he never employs this, the, the term Nevoah prophecy, but the whole theory of the Ramban to describe all, to, to understand all of Yosef's actions and his relationships to his brother is all based, what underlies it, and lies at the f- f- fundamental point, the Evan Pina, on which everything is built, is Nevoah. And I know there are some who say that the Chalomos never came to fruition. There are some who argue that Binyamin never actually bowed down to Yosef, and Yaakov never bowed down to Yosef. The Ramban is totally opposed to that approach because he believes, and we saw it in the Targum, because we saw it in Rashi, we saw it in Aviv Shar Es Adover. It's almost explicit in the Psukim. Yaakov really understood that these Chalomos had to take place. And Yosef had a good track record when it came to dreams and their interpretation and their fruition, their fulfillment. Gam ha'inyan ha'sheni says the Ramban, sh'osu lahem you remember how he hides the goblet in their sacks, lo shetia kavanosu l'tzaron, avol choshar ula yeshlem sino b'binyomin. Maybe they harbored some resentment and some jealousy against binyomin as they did against he himself against Yosef himself. She kanu also. They would be jealous of the Avasaviam kikinosam bo. O Shemeh Hirgish bin Yom and Shaya bin Yodam bin Yosef bin Nolda beneem ktato usin of Alkelo Rotso she yelechi moem bin Yomin. He had to somehow get bin Yomin back to Mitzrayim 
and send the brothers to, to retrieve Father Jacob and the whole group, the whole clan, if he would allow the brothers, if he would allow Binyamin to accompany his brothers, Ulai says the Ramban, Yishlechu Bo Yodam. Here's where the Ramban does actually use that, that, con that co uh, concept of manipulating the events in order to test the brothers, but not to test them for the purpose of tshuva and tochacha, but to test them for the purpose of guaranteeing the safety and the security of Binyamin. Could they be trusted to be alone with Binyamin on this long trek back to Knaan? Perhaps they would take revenge against Binyamin because they harbor resentment against him just as they had done with regard to Yosef himself. Until he checked them out and he determined their love. And if you skip the next paragraph for a moment, take a look at the paragraph of Chena Omer. This is the paragraph that I mentioned at the beginning of the Shia tonight. That the entire sequence of events which was arranged by Yosef with great ingenuity because of the solution is interpretation of the dreams. How could it be possible that over all this period of time, seven years as the viceroy of Egypt, he wouldn't send a message back to his father to notify him? But again, it all comes back to the premise and the fundamental conclusion of the Ramban, HaKol Asiyof of the Ito, L'Kayim HaChalomos, Yoda, she is Kaimu the MS. In the next few minutes that we have, I would like to ask a kind of rhetorical question. But if anyone wants to come forward and answer, I don't know if you'll come up with the same answer that I will. What is the most dramatic moment of the entire parsha? of Yosef on the second round. Not, I'm not talking about the sale of Yosef. I mean, that's dramatic enough. But on the, if you will, the reconciliation and this entire long process over the last two parashas, especially parashas Vayigash that we read last Shabbos, where does it reach a pinnacle? The revelation. Can you isolate two words? Yes. Exactly, I mean Yosef. Now, I, I want to I wanna play a little bit of a, uh, what should I call it, a pedagogic game with you. And what I want to do is ask you the following question, but you have to be honest with me. In other words, don't try to second guess me, because then, then I won't succeed. But really try to be, give me an intuitive, natural, you know, knee-jerk response. What should have been, what do we anticipate would have been the response of the brothers to Ani Yosef. And, and to describe this, this question to you, to detail it, I want to mention the following four points. And I wrote them down for myself so I don't forget. Number one, Rav Baaretz. It's already two years of famine. Now, you might ask two years of famine, how severe is that? Is that a critical situation? Well, listen to this puzzle. These are the brothers talking to Yaakov. This is Yehuda making the pitch to bring Binyamin down. Lama namus gamanachdu gam tapenu. Now again, I take this puzzle kipshuto. I don't know. You might reinterpret it. But literally what it means, Lama namus. At what point had they reached as a result of the rough? It was the danger. It was critical Lama namus. This is what we call pikuach nefesh mamash. Gamanachnu gam What's at stake here is the hatzola of kol beis Yisrael. And keep in mind that that famine is going to continue for five years. Now imagine if a little birdie would whisper into into 
let's say, Yehuda's ears and then into Yaakov's ears. Hey, you know what? Your brother is the viceroy of Egypt. Not only the most powerful country on the face of the earth, but the country that has storehouses, warehouses full of grains that could survive, that could maintain you and save Beis Yisrael. What would be your response? Number two. Keep in mind that immediately prior, the, the exact event prior to Yosef's revealing himself on the Yosef was taking Binyamin into custody, accused of a major crime of theft against the king, and the declaration of the brothers, Hine Onu Anachtu Avodim Ladoni. Let's make a swap, let's make a deal. You give us Binyamin, and you've got us all. Now, wait a minute. What are the repercussions, imagine, of the brothers becoming slaves in Mitzrayim? Being thrown into a jail the way Yosef himself had suffered? What are the implications in terms of Beis Yisrael, in terms of the wives and the children of the 70 Nefoshals? Now, let's whisper into the ears of the Achim. Hey, you know what? You're not going to be our father. Your brother is second in command. Number three, what was the state of mind of the brothers vis-a-vis Yosef? According to one medrash, when the brothers came down to Mitzrayim, they searched through every street and every alleyway, maybe we'll find our brother Yosef. And all of a sudden, there he is, and Yosef. What would this mean in terms of Yaakov, Father Jacob? For 22 years, Yaakov mourned, grieved over his lost son, and refused any kind of consolation. He didn't accept Nechal. What would that mean to the brothers if Father Jacob would snap out of his depression knowing that his son, Yosef, is still alive? And finally, what was Yaakov's response when he got the news? Vayafag libo kilo hem in lahem. Says the Rabban, what is Vayafag libo? Mitok simcha. He was so overwhelmed with joy. And the Rabban, has, using his knowledge of medicine, of physiology, of biology, claims that sometimes the news that a person hears, that, that, he, that, that is revealed to his ears, is so powerful, so overwhelming, that his heart can't take it. He misses a beat. And by the way, I think the, the neuro, the neuro um, heart people, I forget what they call them, are, are coming up with research to really prove, not knowing this Ramban, but to prove the thesis of the Ramban, that sometimes you are so overwhelmed with joy that your heart just can't, can't function the way it normally functions. The neurons that are sent, the messages from the brain, just, you know, something gets, gets sent to the heart. The heart is a seat of emotion. It's an expression. It skips beat. Skips a beat. So getting back to the brothers, what do you anticipate should be the response of the brothers when they find out that forget about famine, they'll be taken good care of. Their brother that they feel so guilty about is alive and well. That their father will be consoled. That they don't have to serve as slaves, they can go back to their families and reunite Claudius. What do you imagine would be their response. Relieved. Relieved? That's it? Like you can't give it a little bit more? <laughs> like, can you beef it up a drop? I mean, a little bit more than relieved? You know, it has to be two reactions simultaneously. One is our problems are solved. And the other is it's hanging by a thread with this man. Okay. But again, let, let me focus on the first element. You know, our problems are resolved. Great problems, danger problems, love and novels, and yet they have only one response. They were speechless. Why? Says Rashi, Machmasa Busha. Busha, they are humiliated. I want to submit to you, Rabosai, 
that there is one emotion that is so powerful, it is so overwhelming, that it banishes, that it overrides, that it neutralizes all other emotions, as natural as they may be. And that is Busha. It's unbelievable how much emphasis Chazal put on Busha. Rabbi Yonah dedicates so much of his Sefer Atshuva to the concept of Busha, how important it is in the process of repentance to feel Busha. Busha is not just a physical sentiment. Busha is an emotion that is so deep, it comes from the Nisham itself. It banishes away all other feelings. This was the experience of the brothers of Yosef. And Chazal, very famous Medrash. Oy lanu miyom adin. Oy lanu miyom Yosef was the younger of the brothers. And all he said to them was, Ani Yosef. He didn't give them Musr, he didn't give them Tolchacha. Oy lanu, look how powerful the Yom Adin is. When a person faces the reality, it stares him in the eyes. It just flashes him in the face. You thought all these years that you were the great guys and you were controlling them and you got rid of Yosef and you snubbed them out. Oh no. Ani Yosef. Your whole philosophy of life, everything that you built of, you're the stack of cards, just simply collapses in front of your heart. It's meaningless. Why? Because Anochi, Ani Yosef. That element of Busha, when a person realizes that his, soul, his entire system of priorities is, is, is distorted, is warped. Say Chazal. Oilon of Yom Antin. Liachar Meya Vies, Chas Vishalom, when we get up. That's where the real Musa, we, we opened up tonight's discussion with, is there bounds to Musa? Well, in the human court, there are bounds. You can't overstep your bounds. Yosef, according to the various shittos that we explained tonight, the three approaches, was guided by solid rules and to achieve very, very important goals. So there are bounds. But in the heavenly court, when we get up to the base and show Malo, and they will show us, how should I say, maybe on a video, maybe on a kosher tube, I don't know what, but maybe it won't be so kosher. They will show us every slideshow of everything that we did and all the falseness of our lives and the redifas are covered and all the other things that we run away from, run, run after, and how perhaps our entire system of priorities is completely warped and what we're running after is garnished, is nothing, is sheker v'hevo. It's chas v'sholem if we face that Ani Yosef in which the reality of, of the falsehood of our existence is simply presented in front of our eyes, is then But our hope is that with the guidance of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the Torah and the Chachamim and our leaders, we pursue in the right fashion and with the right, correct system of priorities, we dedicate our lives to things that are so important to Hashem, to His people, to Klal Yisrael, to Eretz Yisrael. And therefore we have no fears from that ultimate encounter in the heavenly court, Lachar Be'ev Yisrael. We should be Zolchem Bedin. We should do Tshuva. And we should set our record straight so that we have nothing to fear. And then in Yitz Hashem we'll all be Zolchem Bedin. Mekabal Pnei Shechina and Pnei Mashiach Tzidkeinu Dimheira V'yameinu. Amen.